look at the difference. You can see the forebrain as this dark structure above my hand right here. The forebrain in this one starts on the right and goes all the way back to the left. The difference in the brain, 50% of the brain is, is gone in mass. Why? Because the hindbrain is developed. Look at the big bulge sticking above my hand. That's the hindbrain. What's the function of this? This is an athlete. <laughs> what is this? This mouse is a mouse athlete. Why? It's got great muscles. It's got great reflexes. But it's a little short on the intelligence. And it turns out, a fact, 40 to 50% of a child's IQ potential is determined by the prenatal environment. This paper is illustrating that. It says in the uh, subtitle, the uh, genetic heritability of IQ remains highly contentious. A new analysis shows that genetic influences may be weaker and prenatal environmental influence is greater than previously appreciated. It's based on a paper that reveals 40 to 50% of the potential IQ of a child is a variable based on the perception of the mother during pregnancy. And that says, look at the way we raise kids today. Look at parents in inner city situations. Look at parents that are single parents that don't know whether they'll be able to provide for their child and for themselves. These parents live under high stress. When they live under high stress, the stress hormones cross the placenta and impact the child, selecting genes which alter the development and evolution of that child, as you saw in the Newsweek article, that it can select genes that lead to cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, are all been linked now to prenatal environmental influences. The role of the parent is highly important in the evolution of humans on this planet. It's called conscious parenting. Because when we're unconscious, we create athletes or fight street fighters. Street fighters is what ultimately be, they become. They live not off of brains, they live off of brawn. And we live in, in a world that we are experiencing lesser intelligence in the population year after year after year. The down dumbing of America. One of the main reasons, we haven't given attention to the reality that the child is being programmed genetically in utero in response to the mother's perception of the environment. This one is a very, very interesting and recent article in science, non-genomic transmission. That means transmission without genes. Non-genomic transmission across generations of maternal behavior and stress responses in the rat. And here's what it says. When a mother raises a child, that infant and from the neonate time is learning how to raise its own child that when, it, when that child grows up, it will raise the child the way it was raised. So the interesting part is when we raise a child, we're not just raising the next generation because we're also then influencing the subsequent generation because that, our child will raise their child the way we raise them. And the relevance about that is it's not genetic. And the interesting part is, then this means that we've also recognized as well as the mother, oh, let me read the quote right off the bottom here. It says, they have shown that the environment can trigger differences in behavior and in stress-related gene expression that are passed on to the next generation. Meaning, how you live your life today will alter the genetics and behavior of your child tomorrow because you can pass this on immediately in one generation. And the significance of that is then all of a sudden the power of not recognizing that we've been doing this has to come into our lives so that we can start raising a generation that we can live with rather than a generation that may kill us in the end because of the, of the amount of aggression that we're building in and violence, which is a known part of this process right here, especially related to stress-related genes because in response to stress, violence is one of the primary ways of responding. So how does the brain work? That's this Jerry Van Amergen cartoon. So we're going to close out here in a couple of minutes. So hold on, we're just about finished. Let me explain something about the brain. It's a process of connections, connections of experiences. Experiences come into our, our perception. Perception is experience. That's what it is. And as we get a perception, we set up our body to respond to that perception. So basically, it says this. The brain is a device that converts whatever the experiences are into awareness. So light comes into my eyes, but electromagnetic vibrations go out my nerve. Sound comes into my ear, but electromagnetic vibrations come out my nerve to my brain. Touch is physical pressure, but electromagnetic vibrations come up my arm. The point is, the brain converts all of this environment into electromagnetic vibrations, which become our awareness. But the part about the brain is that it records these things. 
so that as an experience comes in, not only are we seeing the picture at this moment and our live awareness, but we are also recording the ability to remember that experience. Why? And the answer, this is this, is this really critical but interesting part, is why? And the answer is this, because if I take my awareness and play it back through my brain, I repeat the experience again. The bottom line is the brain is a recorder. It's like a slide, it's like a camera that takes a slide. Here's a picture of what I learned, and then awareness is the light bulb that illuminates the slide. So when I take my awareness and play it back through the slide, I recreate the behavior. So as much as people don't want to hear it, and somebody says, well, you're just like your mom, or you're just like your dad, and you go back and go, no, it can't be. And the reality is, yeah, because your behavior is how you learn from them, and your behavior is a playback of your experiences. But then you say, wait, I have free will, I have a mind. I could think of different things. And the answer is this, this is where the critical part comes out, is, is this. It's based on this picture I'm going to show you, but it's based on this fact first. It is estimated that 4 billion nerve impulses are coming into your brain every second. While you're sitting right now, 4 billion nerve impulses are hitting in your brain every second. But you can only handle approximately 2,000 bits of that data in consciousness. What does that mean? Well, it says that most of the information that's coming in is not being, you're not being consciously aware of it. I'll give you an example. Okay, you've been looking at the slides up here. All of a sudden, focus on the shirt on your back. Just focus on a sec. Can you feel it? Go, go ahead, move a little bit. Can you feel that sitting back there? And the point was, were you not feeling your shirt before I asked you to feel it? The answer is, no, you were feeling it all the time. Nerves don't shut off. They're always coming in. But the fact was what? Well, you weren't paying attention to it because it wasn't necessary for you and your consciousness to bring up the fact, hey, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt. It's like, I know I'm wearing the shirt. You don't have to tell me. So the brain is smart. Things that it knows, it does not bring up to your conscious attention. Why? Because your conscious attention only can handle such a small percent. Let me show you what percent. Imagine there are four billion little tiny pixel dots that make up this landscape, and that this represents all the information coming into your brain right now. How much of this information in the slide actually enters into your consciousness? And the answer is, you see that little dot? If you can, or if you can't see it, that dot is a thousand times larger because I had to be able to show it to you. In other words, where's all this? What's all this stuff? And the stuff is, it's information that's coming into your head right now, but why isn't it in your consciousness? The answer is, because if you've already learned how to do something or respond to the signal, there's no reason it's like, hey, you got a shirt on, you got a shirt on. I don't need to know that. And the point about it is this, then most of our behavior, listen to this, most of our behavior has been from experiential replaying over and over and over again. So the concept is this, most of the behavior that you elicit, you don't think about consciously. I'll give you an example. For those that drive a car, it's a great example. Have you ever gotten in a car and gotten in a discussion with somebody while you were driving and you talked and you talked and you talked and you realized about a half hour later that you've been driving for a half an hour, you haven't paid attention to anything on the road? but you also realize you got here too, so you didn't hit anything either. And the point about it was what? Because driving is a learned experience that you can put it into your programming and do it automatically. Walking is a learned experience. I broke my knee a few years ago, and when I had it reconstructed, I realized I had to relearn how to walk because it took a whole process of how to move the leg and step and all that because when they rebuilt it, it broke up all the old pathways. And the point was, my God, when I walk down the street now, I don't think about moving this, yet it involves a lot of coordination, a lot of learning went into this. And the bottom point is this, then most of the behavior that you elicit is transparent to you. You don't even see it. Why? Because it's so automatic that on the job and whatever you're doing, it just comes out. Somebody pushes the button, you make a response. You're not thinking. You're, you're thinking about, well, I want to go on vacation. I can't wait to go home. I'm looking forward to this. And yet you're doing your job. How can you do that and still have those other thoughts go on in that little tiny dot of consciousness? And the answer is this, because almost all of our actions are out of our purview. We don't see them. They're repeated automatically. And why does this get to be a problem? It's the difference between walking your talk and not walking your talk. Why? In your head, you, you are a good person. You say to yourself, I'm a, you know, I'm, I try, I'm being good, I, I want to lose weight, I want all these things, why can't I control it? And the answer is, because all that consciousness represents is that little tiny dot. Most of the control, 99.999999% 
is already pre-programmed from your learned experiences. You can't lose weight just because that little conscious dot says so. You have to recognize you have weight because of whatever learning experiences you had about your life, they were programmed in there. You can get rid of the program, you could get amnesia. So I'll give you an example. Remember the movie regarding Henry with Harrison Ford? Here's a lawyer who gets shot and, and wakes up in the hospital he has got amnesia. Who am I? What am I? Well, we know what's going on here. So they take him home and his wife tries to say, this is how we live and all this. And he goes to the job and all his work people are showing him. And he's a lawyer, you know, and he, start, he starts to look at, review from a distance, his life. Because he wanted to fill the picture back in. And as he started to put the picture back in, he all of a sudden he made up his mind. He said, you know, that really stinks. This is a stinking life. 